Matthew chapter number 14, let's start in verse 13. The Bible says this, when Jesus heard of it, so we have to stop there, what did he hear? If you go to verse 14, verse 1 to 12, it's talking about Herod putting John the Baptist into prison. Because John the Baptist came to him and says, it's wrong for you to take your brother's wife. And Herod was like, you don't say stuff like that, prison. And so John the Baptist is in prison, and Herod throws an awesome birthday party for himself. And during that birthday party, his brother's wife's daughter did a dance number that pleased him. And in the heat of the moment, he said, I'll give you whatever you want. And if you read the text, it says that her mom already told her that when he says, I'll I'll give you whatever you want, you're going to ask for John the Baptist's head in a platter. So the dance was choreographed. I just thought about it. The dance was not like an accidental thing. It was choreographed. It was, I mean, it, it was perfectly um, triggered to cause Herod to respond that way, and which he did. And so John the Baptist got beheaded. His head was placed in a platter, and it was brought to Pharaoh's wife now, Herodias. And so when he says here, when Jesus heard of it, that's what he's talking about. He heard that John the Baptist, his forerunner, the one who went before him to prepare the way, but not just his forerunner, they're not just co-workers. Remember, they're family. That's his cousin. And so Jesus Christ in the midst of ministry, in Mark chapter 6, a parallel passage, it talks about Jesus Christ just did a preaching tour and, and preached all over the place. And so he's tired. And then he hears that his cousin and his forerunner just got beheaded. And his disciples are tired. And so that's the place where Jesus Christ is at this moment. When he heard that his cousin got beheaded, he's tired, his people are tired around him, and he hears his bad news. And so he departed thence by a ship into a desert place apart. So he decided, you know what, I'm tired from, he's not tired of the work, he's tired from doing the work. He's physically tired, so he, he wanted to take a part and be able to refresh. Vance Havner said it this way. You must come apart to rest before you fall apart. That's why God demands the Jews to take the Sabbath day seriously of rest. Why? Because it's important to refresh. And so Jesus Christ wanted to refresh. He's tired. He's grieving of this loss. But then something happened. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. So now he was supposed to get some rest. Now he was able to, he he was supposed to grieve. Because he did cry when Lazarus died. So he had emotions. He he, he grieved with people. And so there's no doubt in my mind that he's grieving for his cousin and he's tired from the work. But yet he's not going to get some rest. In verse 14, "And and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. You know if I was him, I'm tired from work. I'm overwhelmed with the pressure and negativity of the Pharisees and the scribes. My cousin just died, who was my forerunner. And I'm going to see a bunch of people who wants nothing but to see me do some miracles and heal their sick and preach to them. And when I see the multitude, the reaction would not be this, was moved with compassion. It would be moved with frustration. Leave me alone. I'm tired. Give me a break. Please let me grieve. Give give me the opportunity to get the rest that I deserve. That would be the natural thing, wouldn't it? Don't look at me like you wouldn't feel that way. Because when you're not sleeping and your kids act up up the next day, you're not the holy roller that you are. Thank you. I'll give you a gift card later. Thank you for supporting me. I I felt so alone here for a little bit. But Jesus Christ, when he saw the multitude, the reaction was this. He was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. 
the news is out. We care less. Our generation today care less. University of Michigan did a comp comprehensive study on 14,000 college students between 1979 to 2009. And it showed a sharp decline in empathy. The study concluded that we care 40% less than people did in the 1980s. And some of you sit there today and be like, oh, and you don't care. <laughs> Is that not true? Yeah. They're just kind of like, oh, that's great. Yeah, great news. Maybe I should tweet that. You know, it's, it's not really, it doesn't affect us as much. Why? Because we're, we're, we don't, we care less. We're a lot more selfish these days. And the questions that were asked was this. I sometimes try to understand friends better by looking at their perspective. Less people are doing that. Less, are, less people are trying to understand rather than trying to be understood. Less people have a tender, concerned feelings about those who are less fortunate than them. Some people, uh, fewer people call themselves soft-hearted, and others' misfortunes don't really bother them as much as they used to. But if I was to ask you in the beginning of the message and I said, are you compassionate? The answer would be, I'm pretty compassionate. <laughs> I asked myself that question, and my answer was, yeah, I think I'm pretty compassionate. And I realized that I think I'm compassionate because I have a lot of intentions. I have a lot of intentions to do good things. I have a lot of intentions to witness. I have a lot of intentions to, to, to do what God tells me to do. But if intentions never become actions, they're just intentions. Most of us, our New Year's resolution are the same every year. Because those intentions never turn into action. That's why you don't have a six-pack yet. <laughs> it's just intentions. I, you write it in a piece of paper, and this is what I'm going to do before the new year ends. And it's great intentions. But how many of those intentions become actions? You see, good intentions aren't good enough. To intend to do things is not the same as doing it. No one gets a six-pack by intending to do sit-ups. No one gets paid for intending to work. And no lives will be changed if we intend just to do so. Intentions are not enough. Our intentions has to become action. So let me ask you this question. Do you have compassion? Are you a compassionate person? Do you have compassion as Jesus Christ did? Can I just get this out in the open? It is impossible for you to do this in your own strength. You can't do it because we're selfish. No fights has ever happened in the nursery because they shared too much. It's always because some kid stole somebody else's toy who's not theirs, but they say it's mine. And nothing much has changed. We just become more adult and, you know, dignified about it in our greediness. We're not compassionate. And so t today, I've just got two thoughts. What compassion is and what compassion does. In order to be compassionate, you got to know what it is. You have to define what it is. So let's notice first here what compassion is. In verse 14, Jesus Christ said this, or Matthew says this. Uh, Matthew 14, 14, I mean, Jesus went forth, saw a great multitude. He was moved with compassion. The word compassion in the Greek is a really long word. Splagnisomehi. Okay? I'm no Greek scholar. I just have a really awesome Bible software that helps me study. Splagnosomehi means this. To have the bowels yearn. No, it's not because it was lunchtime earlier. A lot in this section was... Uh, Splagnosomain earlier, like, no, that's not what it is. Right? That's hunger pain. That's different. To have the bowels yearn. Have you ever uh, maybe seen somebody lose a loved one or an, and you just can't eat? 
It's like no one's forcing you to fast, but you are. It, that's what compassion is. It's, it's your bowels yearn. You feel deep sympathy. But lastly, to be moved to action. Sim uh, compassion is not just an emotion that you feel. It's an emotion that drives you to act. So if there's no action and you feel something, that's not compassion. Compassion drives you to do something about it. You might drive, so you're driving the highway, you see somebody with a flat tire, and you're like, oh, that's so sad. Hey, you going to Starbucks? Okay. What do you want to order? Right? That's not compassion. You just felt bad, but the, the, don't call that compassion. Compassion means when, when you stop in the side of the road and, and you try to help them. That's compassion. But we think we're compassionate because we felt bad about the dude lying on the ground. While it's raining, like, oh, that's so sad. I'll shoot a prayer for them, right? Lord, help them, right? And, and that's it. And we move on. And we think, man, I did my Christian duty today. Well, I've the shoulders off. I'm doing well as a Christian. God's going to bless me. But that's not compassion. Compassion compels you to move, to do something about the situation. Because Jesus Christ, though tired, though grieving, when he saw the multitude, he didn't say, oh, that's so sad. Some of them are sick. All right, disciples, let's get out of here. All right? He didn't do that. He says, when he was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. So compassion is an emotion that drives into action. Compassion is when you shift your focus from self to others. Compassion is when you shift your focus on self to others. Now, it doesn't mean you don't take care of yourself. Because Paul told Timothy, take heed unto thyself and then to the doctrine. So you got to take care of yourself, but it's not all about you. Because the secular will even tell you this. Health before, thank God there's no seculars here, right? So health, you should, you should never put your health before wealth. Because wealth cannot pay for health. But if you have health, you can always make wealth, Right? And so even the secularists have this mindset. You have to take care of yourself. But listen, you can't take care, you can't take care of others if, if you're not taking care of yourself. But at the same time, it's not all about you. Because the majority of us today are conditioned to think of us and to get more. And to gain and to accumulate in the very classic movie, Kung Fu Panda 3. Master Ugwe was talking to Kai. And he said it this way, the more you take, the less you'll have. I'm like, that's, a good, that's good preaching. The more you take, the less you have. Why? Because a life that is lived for self is an empty life. But a life that is lived for others is a fulfilling life. And so compassion is when you shift your focus from self to Others and we live in a society that kind of encourages us to focus on ourselves. That's why they have something called a selfie. Because instead of taking a camera and taking a picture of God's majestic, you know, creation, you flip it around and to take the picture of God's majestic creation, right? <laughs> and we flip it on ourselves. Right? Hey, listen, we're created by God too. We're just as beautiful as those mountains, all right? But we, 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 we focus on ourselves and it's, it's self-centered. We focus more on ourselves and technology does play a role in this. I'll be the first to say I'm not anti-social media. I am not anti-internet. There's a lot of good that you can use. There's a lot of pitfalls if you're not careful, just like cars. But there's a lot of pitfalls in social media. And the pitfalls is this, we're obsessed with ourselves. For those of you who have social media, listen, when you post something and like 100 people like your selfie, your brain releases, studies have shown this, your brain releases dopamine that makes you feel good about yourself. And th that's why there's people that like got into social media and like the first picture get a ton of likes and they get addicted to posting stuff and they just don't stop posting. And it's like, they get addicted to it. Like, they can't go like three days without posting because it's like, oh, I need people's approval. I need people's affirmation. You might laugh, but it's true. It's true. You, because if, if you post it and the only person you're likely is your mom and Scotiabank, you're not going to be happy. 
your fake friend, Scotia Bank, liked your picture. You're not going to be like, yes, too. It depresses you. I told my wife this. In, there's a study that showed Instagram leads to depression. She's like, there's no way. That's not true. And so we search it, Google it, obviously, in, in my smartphone. Right? We, we Googled it. And um, in dailymail.co.uk, something like that, it says, yeah, there's a study showing that Instagram leads to depression. Because everybody's picture there is filtered. It's, it's dolled up. Like, you can blur their acne out. And so you're like, oh, man, my friend in the Philippines is a lot prettier than me, and I'm in Canada. And they're over there, and you're like, how is their face so clean? And you know, like, I'm using clean and clear. I'm under control, but it's, it's not controlling. <laughs> and you look at their picture, and, and you get jealous. And you might even be like, no, I don't, I don't get jealous. Yes, you do. And it bothers you. It, it, it depresses you. But social media focuses a lot on self. And overwhelming exposure to suffering really desensitizes us in, in regards to our compassion. How many of you have Facebook? Don't lie. How many of you guys have Facebook? You guys raise hands. Come on, give me a break. There you go. Awesome. All right, this afternoon, so let's do this together, right? A lot of you raise your hand up in regards to Facebook. When you scroll through your timeline, this is a problem with social media that it, it, it can lead to us having less compassion. Because when you scroll through, you'll see, like, um, recipe for guacamole. All right, or you have the Food Network thing that they do the, uh, the timeline, and it makes the thing, and you're like, it just makes you so hungry, and you say, And so you see that, and when you scroll up, it's like a pastor is in prison in Iran. And you keep scrolling, and it's like, oh, uh, Golden State won again. Right? And then you scroll, and then, and so all these news, and your brain is processing it as the same. And so it's not, it can't differentiate between which one's worse, and you might even like, you know, the, you know, or, praying on the pastor that, that is in prison, but in your mind, it doesn't really affect you because you move the rest of your day, it doesn't really bother you. And social media is really focusing us on that, but God wants us to have compassion, and compassion is when you shift your focus on you and you focus it on others. Jesus Christ, I think, had a well-deserved break. He just came from a preaching tour. He is tired. His cousin and his forerunner just died. But instead of being moved with frustration, he was moved with compassion. And with a tired body and an aching heart, went to the people and healed them. The reason why we're not reaching as much people as we ought to, because we're not really as compassionate as we think we are. We have a lot of intentions that never become action. It's all just good intentions that we, we, we never move and do something about it because doing something about it is uncomfortable. It is hard. It goes beyond what you want to do for yourself. So compassion is, what compassion is, is really when you shift your focus on self and you shift it and focus it on others. So what does compassion do? What, what does compassion do? What compassion is and what compassion does, well, as we see in Jesus Christ's life here, compassion moves us into action. When you have compassion, it moves us into action. When the focus now is on others, we see their need, and then it moves us into action. When you really see somebody for who they really are, when, a lost, when you see a lost person for who they really are, you're not going to just sit there and do nothing about it. You're going to do something about it. If you really are compassionate, you're not just going to intend to do something. You're going to do something about it. In the life of Jesus Christ, in Mark 1, it says, And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. So compassion always leads to action in Matthew 20, 34. So Jesus had compassion on them, and then action follows, and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Compassion moves us into action. If you are a compassionate person, it's going to move you into action. It's not just going to be something that's just embedded in your brain. It's going to be it's going to be demonstrated in your actions and in your body. Compassion moves into action. But secondly, compassion interrupts. Compassion interrupts. In Luke chapter number eight, Jesus Christ was going to go and heal the sick girl, but on the way to heal the sick girl. 
A woman that's been sick for 12 years touches his hem of the garment and interrupts him. The message that was preached this morning by Brother Alvir was Jesus Christ was preaching and a roof opened. Interruption. People who need your help are not going to come at the convenient time. You can't schedule it. You can't just be like, you know what, I'm free, God, bring him in. It's going to be when you're busy, when you're doing something, when you're tired. It's, it's going to be so out of, out of the way, especially when you're in a hurry. That's when the opportunity to be compassionate comes. Let me give you an example. I was, it was a few weeks ago, and my wife and I had been trying to be a healthier couple. And um, she wanted to go to the gym early in the morning, but we have to come here by 9.30 for work, for our meeting. And so we had a plan. I'm going to go in the gym at 6 in the morning, okay? 6 to 7.30, uh, 6, but it had to be up at 7.30. She's going to go there by 7.30 to 8 o'clock, 8.30, and then we're going to get ready and be able to come to work. I got there. I was running a little bit late. I got there, and a, right when I parked, I'm in a hurry. I'm, like, rushing, trying to get out. It's dark. Right when I parked... A guy comes in my window, freaks me out, like, and I lowered it a little bit, like, what? What's up? And I was scared, like, what are you doing? It's so early, like, what do you, what do you want? You know, like, uh, can you help me? It's an elderly man. I said, can you help me? It's like, where do you need help? You know, like, do you want money? You know, I'll give you a dollar or something. I get coins here for Superstore, you know, I can give you a dollar. It's like, no, I, can you jump my car? My car died and it won't start. Can you jump my car? I literally, this is what I did, <laughs> okay? I was kind of like, and he's looking at me the whole time. And I'm in a hurry. My mind is like, go, 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 go. I like, I looked at him. He asked me, I'm like, oh. all right, where's your car? You know, like that, like that attitude. I wasn't like, oh, praise the Lord. What an opportunity. Yeah, let's go, brother. You know, No, I was like, you're going to take my warm-up time and then, I have to go back early. I won't be able to finish my workout, you know, and I won't be able, oh, like, oh, in my mind was like, why? Like, why don't you ask the guy who parked right before me, you know? Why me, you know? And so I'm like, look, I'm sorry, where's your car at? And he, like, pointed, and he's like, guy, it's over there, and there's a parking spot right beside it. It's like, oh, okay, fine. So I back up, and I park right beside it. It's like, no, it's not close enough. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, who is this guy? So I had to back up. Pull close, and I open the hood, and I'm like, and he's grabbing his things, you know, and I'm like, grabbing the, the, the wires, I'm like, do you know what you're doing? And he's like, yeah, I was like, because the last time my father-in-law jumped out his Ford, it, it jacked up his system, because he, he, the guy who did it flipped the, the wires, and it fried his computer. And so I was like, do you know what you're doing? Because I don't want you to fry my system. And he's like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And he's very calm, very kind, but I'm heating, you know, early in the morning, I'm half awake, full in the flesh, you know, I was like, let me just go work out, and he's putting it, and then I, he's like, all right, you can go inside, can you start your car, please, so I start my car, and then he starts his car, and then we wait for a little bit, because you can't just take it out right away, so I'm like, oh my goodness, like, come on, and then he's, he, he takes it off, he says, hey, thank you so much, I appreciate your help, and I was like, yeah, 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 and then I park properly, and then I turn up the, the car, and I'm just like, you idiot, and he left already. Like, you idiot. What, what an opportunity for you to like, give the guy a track. I didn't give him a track. Let's just be honest. I know it's so in kickoff, but man, I didn't give him a track. I just wanted to go to the gym. I was just like, you, you idiot. Why didn't you give him a track? And then the verse pops in, I think in Peter, it says, some of you have entertained angels unaware. I was like, man, that's an old looking angel, but man, he's very nice, you know? I'm just like, oh my word. I did everything with the wrong attitude. Oh, where's your car? You know? He's very nice. I mean, yeah, you better, he has to be nice because I'm not going to jump his car. He's mean, right? But man, compassion interrupts. It, it ruined my morning for a second. And going down the elevator, I realized, man, I can't believe you missed that opportunity. What if God was testing you and you miserably failed? But I'm like, but I jumped his car. You know, but it's, 
I miserably failed. I had a horrible attitude. Oh, man, I totally missed an opportunity. Why? Because those opportunities don't come in a convenient time. It's not going to come in a Thursday morning when I have like three hours to work out. It's going to come at the time where I'm running late and my, my wife is waiting for me to come back so she can go. Compassion interrupts. Jesus Christ was preaching and the thing opened. And he let, the, he let that scenario interrupt him. Compassion will interrupt your life. It's going gonna, it's gonna to interrupt. So compassion moves into action. Compassion interrupts, but also compassion costs. The story of the Good Samaritan that all of us know, and even the secular world know about it. The Good Samaritan, it cost him his money. Some believe that it was two days' wages. In order to help somebody who, has, who would be, in, if he was healthy, would be very racial towards him, who would not be kind to him. He, but he took care of him. That's compassion. Compassion moves you into action. It interrupts your day, and it'll cost you. It cost him money to take care of somebody who saw if the, if the situation was flipped would probably not even consider helping him. But if you love somebody who only loves you back, we saw this in a movie with the teens on Friday, if you only love somebody who loves you back, what kind of a love is that? That's a very selfish love, pragmatic love. And so compassion moves into action. Compassion interrupts. Compassion costs. Lastly, compassion changes lives. When I had the opportunity to go to NBT, man, I had an awesome time. And this week, I was looking through the different letters that I got from, from the little kids. And even parents, you know, hey, my kid is ADD. I knew which kid it was because he sat in front and he could never sit still. Like, very, like, jumpy. But throughout the week, like, he, he, he heard the gospel, he got saved, and he calmed down. Like, what in the world? Little kid, like, about seven years old. And the mom was just in joy and tears. And I have that letter I was reading. But there's one that really stuck out. It was in Georgia. And there was a guy, Pastor Cooper, uh, Pastor Chuck Cooper's uh, a church. And there's a guy there named Daniel Furman. Rough around the edges. Like, like morally, he was really mean. He'd get into fight every time he gets in the bus. He, he's just mean to others. Just, man, just horrible, horrible kid. Like, really bad kid. But throughout the week, as he kept listening to the message, it was a story about Billy Block. And we used the story named Billy Block. And he's a bad guy. And the story obviously changes to him getting saved. And at the end of the week, he wrote me a letter. He says, Mr. Chardon, Thank you so much. I mean, the letter, the letters are like, the font size are like 70. You know, it's huge. Like, he wrote me this letter. It says, Mr. Chardon, with an E-N, because nobody ever spells my name. It's Chardon, so it's Chardin. So he, Mr. Chardin, thank you for coming here. I had so much fun. You're so cool. I had to put that, because he did write that. He said, you're so cool. You're so funny. I, I'm so glad you came. And he said this, I will never be like Billy Block. I will never get into fights. And they did. And the teachers told me, like, hey, something happened to Daniel. He's changing. He's not fighting people anymore. Like, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't rip people's ribbons because you get ribbons, and he'll rip it because he wants his ribbons to grow. You know Because every time they memorize a verse that they come to attend, you give him a ribbon, and the ribbon grows. Whoever has the longest ribbon wins a prize. And so he was ripping people's ribbons because he wanted his to grow quickly. And so he was, he was that kind of a kid. Like, if you think about it, if you think about it, all the Jameses in our church, put them all together in one times five <laughs> and not in a Christian and didn't grow up in a Christian home like uh, the Jameses are not bad right they're just very like wiggly they're very like but these guys unsaved like totally like out of control very out of control times five all right and, and so it, man something changed in his life I remember reading that letter and he's like thank you so much for coming I will never be like him I hope you come back and see us he says, I like you so much, Mr. Chardon. I thank you. And he just kept saying that over and over again. And I remember just in the airport reading that. It's like, man, I can't believe it. All I did was I gave him at the end, my, my, I have a ribbon that grows too. And at the end of the week, usually it's the pastor's son that gets the ribbon. The big, my big ribbon that they can take home and put it in their wall. I gave it to him. 
and man, he was he was carrying it like a baby, you know, like just carrying it. Don't touch it, you know, like, like he just carrying it, like he was a man. I was compassion changes lives, but I thought it changes the lives of others. But you know whose life was changed the most? It was mine. Man, just so thankful for the opportunity to to do something. You never think that you're doing stories and. You sweat in Georgia. It is hot in Georgia, right? It's so hot in Georgia. You don't go so winning at noon because it's so too hot. It's, you, you'll burn. It. It's too painful. And so it's hot, and you're like, oh, sometimes you're just like, oh, I don't want to do this. I can't wait to move to somewhere else cold. And yet during that time of ministering and pouring your heart out to people, taking a time, we'd get home like so late. We'd go home around midnight just from talking to teens and ministering to kids and all your heart and effort, and you're putting it, and you're like, I wonder if it's doing anything. Am I changing anybody's life, or is this a waste of time? And then you get those letters at the end of the week, and you're like, man. The life that's changed is not really theirs. It's, it's mine. And that's what compassion does. And whether you're going to take an effort to help somebody else in regards to their spiritual, in regards to their relational and even in their financial, you need to have compassion. Compassion, true compassion, demands action. To say that you care but not act is to not care at all. I pray that we decide today to have compassion. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to worship you.